Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. As we open today's session, I request you to invite somebody to be a part of what is going on. And let's open up this session to the word of prayer. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for the blessing of the word. We open our hearts to receive it. Let it work in us. A good work only you, the Spirit of God, can work. We give you the praise, the glory, the worship, and the thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Today's text will be a lengthy one. And we will take it from the book of Romans chapter 1 from verse 16 to verse 32. Although the crux of the matter will be from verse 24 to 32. We need the other verses to be able to have context. Today we have a question. What happens when people reject God? Today's session will be taken from the book of Romans chapter 1 from verse 16 to verse 32. And we will be taking it from the NIV version. The Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First, to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is at by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. Who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities. His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God no gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings. And birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. For the, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. 
and worshipped and served created beings rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned the natural relations with women and were inflamed with the lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. So God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what they ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness. Evil, greed and depravity they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, god haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree, that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. May the word of the Lord be praised. This is not good news. But, Grace is never amazing until we know the wrath of God. And I think on the canvas of this is why Paul brings this before he unveils the real good news to us. Today we have a question to answer. What happens when men or when societies reject God. And the picture that is painted to us here, which we will break down for you, unveils exactly what happens when people reject God. You know, we live in a society that thrives or rejoices in being very independent. And this cry for independence goes to the other extreme where people feel they don't need God. And we get into a state of godlessness where people completely ignore God and want nothing to do with him. But we need to understand that when we get to that point, we are not improving ourselves. 
Like we saw last week, we get onto a downward spiral that moves from one level to another of moral decadence, of despicable acts, of things that cannot even be imagined. Why? Because this is what really happens when people disregard God. And here today, the Bible says concerning the gospel, Paul paints the picture for us that looks like a black cloth laid out. And later we will see him bring the grace of God so that we understand what it is we are saved from. What would have happened or been to over us if grace had not shown if God's love and mercy had not met us along the way. You see, many times we need to ask ourselves, can we survive without God? Can we function normally as a people without acknowledging God at all? What happens when we cling to our cultures and disregard what God says concerning us? Then we ask, is there hope? after we have gone all the way, is there hope for humanity? So here we look at not only individuals, but this points to a bigger picture of a collective society. It, it may be a whole religious organization. It may be a whole culture, but the sobering truth is laid down there. And here it spells of doom. So when we talk about godlessness, it falls into two categories. There is the first category of atheism. The people that believe that God does not exist. So these go about doing their thing without any regard for God at all. But there is the other group. These ones act as though God doesn't exist. Basically, they believe there is a God, but they don't believe that he should intervene in the affairs of men. And believe it or not, this attitude is widespread in our society today. Where people go about their business, they don't necessarily deny that there is God. But they don't expect him to be active in their lives. And when people move to that level, Paul explains to us how everything goes about. In verse 18, he explains that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven upon all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Basically, what he's trying to say is when we disregard God, we place ourselves 
in a very dangerous spot where the wrath of God is directed at us. But that's not the end of the story. This is only the beginning. And we need to understand what happens when the wrath of God is aimed at ungodliness, ungodlessness. So what happens to these people? It's, it's, uh, although that which is known about God is evident to them, what they choose to do is to suppress it. And when they do that, the Bible says they are without any excuse in verse 20. So, why? Because even though they know God, and I told you there are two revelations about God. There is the general revelation, and there is the special revelation. The general one is creates our awareness that he exists. And the special one is the one that leads us to the saving grace. And the Bible says, when we ignore that, we become fools. We become futile with foolish speculation. And the Bible says they became fools, verse 22. And when they be we become fools, this is what the Bible says. In verse 24, the Bible says God gave them up to the lusts of their heart, to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored. And why? Because they have exchanged the knowledge of God for a lie. And for this reason, God again gives them up. Verse 26. To their error. And again, because they do not see it fit to acknowledge God any longer. God gives them up the third time. So what is this truth Paul is trying to emphasize here? He's trying to explain to us that when men continually suppress the truth of the knowledge of God, you get to a point where you do not see it fit to acknowledge God any longer. So everything that happens is done within the realm of your illogical understanding. Why? Because even though you know God, you do not honor him as God. And what happens when you don't do that? You exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image that is made in incorruptible man. And you may say this is far-fetched, but it is not. How many times do we disregard the word of God? Because of an opinion of somebody we are following or somebody we admire. So we are saying I'm doing this because so and so is said this. But what is God's mind on this? Because God has put his mind on paper. And it is in the Bible. So when we disregard what God has written, and opt for the opinion of men, and opt for the opinion of our peers, what is happening here? We now have 
an image that we are following. And this goes to the several levels of deterioration. We exchange the truth about God for a lie. Why? Because you cannot separate God from his word. God and his word are one. But when we disregard God to a certain level, what happens is that now we open ourselves to sin. And this sewer of sin flows into a river that is polluted that is so contagious that it can corrupt an entire society. It can morally corrupt an organization. And all this comes from the fact that we fail to acknowledge God. And here is a severe punishment for us. Because when people choose to ignore God completely, they don't advance in life. Rather, they are aspiring to their end. So, the Bible tells us, and from here we understand, that if this goes on, we reach a tipping point. And when we get to that point, there is a moral decline that comes with it. We come to a point where we don't want to hear God anymore. So anybody talking about Jesus is apathetic to you. So you, you, you don't want to hear about him mentioned. Why? Because the mention of Jesus brings a certain level of accountability. And we don't want to be accountable. So what happens at that point? The Bible says, in verse 28, so God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things that are not proper. And we have seen God giving them over in verse 24. We saw him give them over in verse 26. Now he gives them over to a depraved mind. Let's look at the word give them over. When it says God gave them over, what does it mean? Give them over is a Greek word, paradidomi. To understand it is, is like being given over in judgment. When Jesus was paraded before Pilate, and Pilate washed his hands, and he says, I'm not guilty of this man's blood. He got him and gave him over to the Pharisees and the Jews. And that giving over is the word paradidom. Now it is what Paul talks about concerning God. When he gave over Jesus. 
Romans 4.25 He says, and he was delivered over because of our transgressions. It is the same word that he uses when he, he comes to Romans 8.32. And it says he did not spare his only son. But he delivered him over. So Jesus was delivered over. Which is the paradidomim. To the most stringent judgment imaginable. For our sins on the cross. So he suffered the full wrath of God's justice. And died in the place of sinners. He was abandoned by the Father. And then he's on the cross he did cry, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is delivering over. That is the paradidomi that we are talking about. And this same word is used so frequently in the Acts of the Apostles. And it is used in the context of them being arrested and handed over to be put in prison. So when it says that God gave them over to a depraved mind, having given them over to sexual immorality or uncleanness in verse 24. In verse 26 to 27, he gives them over to their vile passions. Now he gives gives them over to a depraved mind. A depraved mind is the Greek word adokimos. This means that their thinking is no longer capable of reasonable thought. So you cannot think rationally. You cannot think logically concerning the issues of life. So they make insane choices that they would not otherwise have made. And you see, it is all over us. So when people reject God, they get to that tipping point and they have sunk to such a point that whatever decisions they make is illogical. And you think, how in the world could somebody think like that? They have been given over to a depressed mind. And it is, when that happens, you begin to get to see a rotten society. So the Tragic result of a depraved mind is what Paul unveils to us from verse 29 to verse 31. Here we see the longest list of vices found anywhere in the Bible. You see, we have not seen this longer anywhere. Here we see the longest list. But I believe it is not the most comprehensive. No, what he's trying to 
paint here is not an all-inclusive list. You see, I have met somebody who told me. Say, say, no, you see, where is this found in the Bible? And I'm like, no. The, the Bible is not your catalog. That if this despicable act is not in the Bible, then it is not despicable. No, no, no. The Bible gives you what is a representative. But when you get to that level, there is so much that can happen within that space. So basically what you see here is the tipping point. What you see here is a synopsis that Paul gives us of a people that is godless. And a morally deprived people or culture. Paul breaks it down and says into four sections. And here he begins to use words like they are being filled with which is the Greek word plero. So being filled with all kinds of evil. Now what being filled with, now for you to understand it, you need to contrast it with Ephesians 5.18. Where the Bible says that we need to be filled with the Spirit. So what is he trying to say? Is there he says, don't be drunk with wine wherein is dissipation, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Well, when you see somebody who is drunk, they are, they, they, in the secular language, they say they are under influence. So basically, when somebody is drunk, they are under the influence of alcohol. Now, when Paul says, be ye filled with the Spirit, using the word prayer, it is simply saying, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now here they're saying being filled with all kinds of evils. Basically what they're saying, they're not the ones directing the evil. It is the evil directing them. It is the evil that is influencing them. That is why the devil comes in to orchestrate all kinds of evil. So they are not casual partakers of evil. Uh -uh, they are under the power of evil. So it is evil that is influencing what they do. So what happens to such a people? Number one, Paul unveils to us the sinfulness that clouds their lives. Here Paul writes and says, being filled with all unrighteousness. And he uses the word all unrighteousness. Basically meaning it is unrighteousness at every level. And the word unrighteousness we have met previously is the word adikia. In other words, departing from God's standard. So what is happening here? We see the ungodliness which is an entire 
kind of attitude. Tulaba obutaba na tisa ya katonda nga chikola cha munda mumuntu. Now having an external action. Katecheza de bibu alwanga bibi kolwa kunguru. So as a result of being irreverent to God. E viva mubutaba na kutia katonda. Now we have lawless behavior towards him. Tudamu mumpisa ezenso nijari. So. Paul addresses this wickedness, which is the Greek word poneria, which means evil plots or purposes. And here he, it points to or describes scheming of evil men who commit deeds of wickedness. So they do not wait for sin to come to them. No, they initiate the plots to commit sin. And this is like a chain. One links into the other. And what is next is greed. Which is the Greek word pleonexia. So this is an evil desire for more. A, a total lack of contentment with what you have in life. So no matter where they are in society, they are restless. There is a craving for more. And what drives this craving is envy. They believe that they must always have more. And Paul completes this section by mentioning evil, which is kakia, which is the desire to injure others. So this greed comes with the saying, the end justifies the means. So in other words, they will harm others in order to get what they want. They will run over people in order to get up to the ladder. They will step on other people in order to fulfill their greed. And then Paul ends section one. He goes to section two. Now in section two, he points to the sinful pursuits. And here he says they are full of which is the word mestos. So he says they are full of. In other words, sin is now overflowing. Just imagine a cup that of tea that you're pouring. And then you keep pouring even when it gets to the brim. So what you have is an overflow. When God gives you over to the depravity of mind, the art that is depraved cannot contain the rising evil that fears it. So evil keeps coming until evil now overflows. So what happens when evil overflows? What is evident is if envy, which the Bible calls in Greek phythonos. Now this is jealous. It is wishing evil on others. So you desire that others don't get what is good. You seek to injure people so that you get what they have. And, and we see this in society. Then it causes 
the, its next cousin is murder. Which is phonos. Here is where people are willing to kill. In order to gain. They are willing to take life. And it goes all the way from abortionists to people who are paid to murder others. Paul then talks about strife, which is eris, which means contention, quarreling, arguing and bickering. So this is anyone, they will fight anyone in order to get what they want. So this embattled spirit is followed by deceit which is the Greek word dolos. And here you use trickery. These Individuals are willing to lie so that they can acquire whatever they want. And the last scene in this section is Maris. Now, Maris is, speaks of a malignant hatred that fills up on the inside of somebody. And as I speak, you know where you are. And this is the moment for you to get before God and ask, allow his mercy. Ask for his mercy. His mercy will flood your heart. He will wash away every faith. Because in section 3, Paul now brings to us what we call the sinful practices. We've seen the pursuits that bring an overflow. But it doesn't end there. It goes to the practices. And here Paul begins by stating that these God rejectors are gossipers. Now, gossip literally means the whisperers. So they come up with clandestine conspiracies. In the darkness, for no other purpose than perpetuating evil. He says they are slanderers. In other words, they, what their goal is to defame others. And what is the root of that? It is because they are haters of God. They have rejected God. And they have not just rejected him, they hate him. And this is the heart of the problem. No wonder this is number 12 in this list that Paul gives us. Of 21 evils, this is number 12, which speaks of that completeness. Why? Because the heart of their problems is the problem of the heart. So what happens? People become Become insolent, despiteful. So the, it describes those who are lifted up with pride. So they can insult anyone. They can verbally attack anyone. They can degrade anyone with their insults. And the Bible goes on to say they are arrogant. <laughs> So they raise themselves above others. They are egoistic in nature. They have this overwhelming sense of self-importance. But what is happening is they're going into a darker and darker sphere of their life. They are sinking and sinking lower. 
into reigns of depravity. Paul then says they are disobedient to parents. In other words, they are rebellious. They have no authority they submit to. So they, everywhere they are, they are the masters. They believe they are the masters of their own faith. They, they, they do what is right in their eyes. And in section 4, he then lists the sinful perversions. And this is what we see from verse 31, where he uses the prefix a. Which in Greek is a, in English is an. So one, he says, they are without understanding. Which the Bible calls asunestus. In other words, they are without intelligence. Of thought concerning God's morality. So this renders them incapable of making any decision that is aligned to the moral law of God. So there is no black, there is no white. To them, everything is rational. So their conscience is seared and at those, this point. They, they cannot understand the truth of God to the basic level. And the Bible goes on to say these people are untrustworthy. Some versions call them covenant breakers. So they are pledged to do something no longer matters. They will say something today and do the opposite, say the opposite tomorrow. So there, there is no vow they will make that you cannot break. Be it a business contract, be it a marriage vow, they, anything, they will break it and life goes on. They, they cease to be people of principle. So whatever is expedient to fulfill their selfish desires, that is what they get. And Paul then goes to say these people are unloving. And merciful. In other words, they have no compassion for anyone in need. Their only desire is self-gratification. They have no regard for good for others. This is the inevitable cycle that you go through when you reject God. And although they knew God, Paul says in verse 32, that although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are, un, are worthy of death, they not only practice them, but they also give approval to those who practice. In other words, they know the law of God. Romans 2, 14, 15 says that God has written the moral law upon our hearts. Every person is born with a conscience. It is that inbuilt alarm that informs them of what is pleasing to God. But at this point, they have crossed that line long ago. And they are now in forbidden 
territory. They, they know what they're doing is worthy of death. And this is with regard to the second death. Yet what do they do? These make very good cheerleaders. They, they make very good recruiters. So they want as many people as possible to fo- go along with them. So what happens? They bring their shameful act to the fore. To the public. They, they proudly and defiantly go about in their evil ways. And this is where the social media and television ratings go up. So they sell more copies. They expand their viewership. And what is happening? They are extending or perpetuating their evil doings. And this is where we are today. It doesn't, it's, it's not far fetched for you if you went and found what is trending. You will find evil is trending more than good. If you're looking at ratings, it is evil that is being rated highly. That is where the popularity is. The question is, is there hope? And this is where Paul affirms to us. Yes, there is hope. And that hope is the gospel. And that is why he began by saying, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to those that believe. What is the point here? What can change this is not petitions. What can change is not us petitioning to the parliament or to the laws of the land. No. This is a hard matter. It, it cannot be changed by politicians. It, it cannot be changed by us talking about it. It can only be changed by the power of God that is unleashed through the gospel that explodes in the lives of men and reverses this downward course. What is it that I'm driving? You see, when we refuse the truth of God, anybody who takes that path, takes a path that takes them further away from God. And it is like going down a river carried by a current where you cannot come back. It takes the gospel of Jesus Christ to hold that trail and return you to normal. Now, let me speak to somebody who is saying, Pastor, you have been speaking. It's not too late. Right now, you can call upon him. Call upon Jesus. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right now, call upon him. When Peter was sinking, I will give you an analogy. He walked on water. But when he saw the tempest, fear came over him. And he began to drown. And he cried, Master, save me. Jesus saved him. Even now, 
You can cry upon him. You can call on him. And he will save you out of this mire. Why don't you pray this prayer? Why don't you say, Jesus, I believe you are the savior of mankind. I am a sinner sinking in this mire of sin. I believe that you are my sin. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Save me, Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. Wash me with your blood. Thank you. Amen. Right now, he has said. Call that number on the screen. Somebody will give you the first instructions in this work of faith. The power of God, the power of the gospel will explode on the inside of you. Change you inside out. Purpose will return to you. Now for you who is born again, I have a message for you. We cannot do everything. But we can do what we must do. And what is it that we must do? We must. And we must purpose to take this gospel of Jesus Christ to every creature. That is what we must do. That is what you can do. Reach out one soul at a time. Why? I understand that the task of evangelism is beyond any one of us. But we must do what we can do. You and I cannot sit back passively. Why people around us are perishing. God has always worked. And will always work through willing basis. Avail yourself. And go about doing the Lord's work. You will see that out of this gloom and doom, the glory of God will rise. Will you take that gospel? Father, I thank you for this moment. I pray for my brother or sister who has purposed this day to be a carrier of good news. Your word declares that how lovely are the feet of them that bring good news. As they go out, go with them, Lord, confirming your word with miracles, signs, and wonders to the glory and honor and the praise of your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. God richly bless you. And from Dominion Church, it's been an honor to you to have you. So till then, say shalom.